son de, son de brat. Um, the song, uh, song de li, doya ha, yuchi ha, muskogi, shudane, adane. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? It is a beautiful afternoon. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot, in fact, is beauty. Uh, and uh, when Dave reached out to me, you know, to come and say a few words today, um, there's so much that could be said. But I'd like to keep it really on, I think, something that's important for all of us to remember right now at this moment and uh, that is the world is full of a tremendous amount of ugliness right now and sometimes that's all we see is the ugliness and you see it on tv you read you see it on your the web pages you're you're searching and um when I started working on my book on climate change um, about 13 years ago now, writing on it in seven and primarily 2008, um, I got really depressed because I thought I was going to write about it from the indigenous side of things, but I thought, well, I at least need to find out what the scientists are saying about climate change. And so I started reading all the science. And I got depressed because these folks were saying, this is very serious, not sure we're even prepared to deal with it. And I was going, holy cow, scientists tend to be fairly conservative. That's why, by the way, in all their models, they're always underestimating how much the planet is warming because they're cautious. They, they're going to be conservative and so we're now seeing that those conservative models were just that and that the real world is changing much more rapidly warming much more rapidly than even some of those scientists thought it would two decades ago but I got really depressed and so I started talking to, to some of the wise people that I met, none have PhDs after their names, or, you know, MDs, or EDDs, but uh, people like Albert Whitehat of uh, Sente Glaska University, Rosebud Sioux, people like the legendary Billy Frank Jr., the Nisqually leader of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and a lot of people that I had met, people I would call elders, wisdom holders through the years of being at Haskell now for almost uh, in January I think it will actually be 36 years and so I've met a lot of beautiful people in those 36 years worked with uh, tribal leaders like Steve Cadu here and the Cadu of the uh, uh, you know uh, Kickapoo Nation and um, after talking to them, every one of them said, Dan, you've read enough of the science. Remember our teachings, our lessons, our teachers. And every one of them reminded me that, you know, in, in our traditions, in my Zoya Ha traditions, our first instructors with the land itself, the air, and the water. Those were our first teachers. And then the plants, and then the animals. We don't, that's not metaphor. They showed us something about how to be more competent human beings in the places that we called home. And they reminded me, said, when you start looking around you, you'll see that in spite of everything that we've done, humans, humankind has done, we are still surrounded by beauty. And I, 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 I've been thinking about this a lot because I don't, I think it's so powerful that we have an artwork 
that's speaking to the most important thing we all need to do now, and that is somehow we've got to walk away from the dominant kind of worldview that's been ruling um, not all, everyone on the planet, but a good number of people on the planet, and some who have a lot of power and are, like to use it. And um, that is a reorientation. It's a rethinking about how we can live as mature, confident, respectful, and responsible human beings on this planet. So here's the good news. You've all heard that apocryphal quote attributed to Einstein, which no one can show that Einstein ever said this, but it sounds wise. It sounds like something maybe Einstein would have said. Uh, allegedly, when asked by a colleague for advice on a difficult problem, he said, remember, you can't solve problems with the same kind of thinking that created it. We are so lucky in the United States of America to have 574 federally recognized indigenous peoples, tribal nations, incorporated Alaska Native villages, and guess what? Many of those peoples hold worldviews and knowledges that are quite different than the ones that have created the crisis that we now see. They never thought in boxes and they never worked in silos. And we need that knowledge now desperately. So I, I think that, you know, Dave's work is really as, as important a contribution to asking us to think about how we can change our own worldviews. And I'll go ahead and say it. I think we need a whole scale effort to indigenize worldviews on the planet. Because if we did so, there would be a couple of things that would immediately stand out. And again, why is it that artists often are the ones who hold out this creative spark and this ability to make us feel beauty? They talked about this being a community project. If we're going to address climate change, I guarantee you it's going to be a community project. It's not going to come from the top down, I'm sorry. I think we have some really hard work to do. Yes, we need major structural changes. But if we get organized as communities, if we get organized and use the power, you know, of the ballot box, as effectively as we can, we're going to realize that all of this that we're engaged in right now is really about a restoration of really a kinship view of the world. So let me give you a quick, um, I'll, I'll make this quick, you know, the problem with uh, university professors is we're programmed to lecture on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for 50 minutes. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we go an hour and 15 minutes, okay? But it's Sunday. Oh, I, wow. Hey, get this kid in my class at, at Haskell. I, I, that's the first time I've ever had a round of applause for taking 15 minutes or, or, or an hour and 15 minutes to talk about something. Thank you, young man. Um, but let's do a, a real quick kind of inventory. And, and these are generalizations. I'm not claiming every indigenous person on the world thinks this way. But one of the advantages of being at Haskell is every semester before COVID now, we were averaging over 100 tribal nations on our campus each academic year. And you typically between from 35 to our high count was one one year, I think it was actually the 17, 18 academic year, we had 143 tribal nations represented from 49 states. Every state's been elected, but Hawaii. Okay. 
And uh, so you do begin to see, you know, we're all different, but there's some things that when we start talking, we all understand. We do. We live in the age of the, we're told, the Anthropocene, the age of man. So far, that doesn't bode very well for the planet, because the age of man seems like we've adopted that view Brett was talking about, the world's all about us, and we're the center of creation. Point one, to indigenize your world. Walk away from the idea that you live among resources. Onondaga, faith keeper, Warren Lyons said at the 25th anniversary of, of Earth Day, we had a little gathering. We got permission to set up a teepee on the ellipse across from the White House. And don't think that was a was an easy permit to get. I mean, Secret Service and Park Service and everyone wanted to know, what are you going to do in that teepee? And he said, well, we're going to pray and sing some songs. Then they really got suspicious. <laughs> then they really got worried. You're going to do what? But Warren made a great comment. He said, you know, when the New York State Natural Resources of resources officers came to Onondaga, they told us, we're here to talk about how you can improve your natural resource management. And Warren said, well, I'm going to have to stop you right there, because we don't have any resources. He says, at Onondaga, and in our language, we honor the trees, the plants, the animals as relatives. They're other than human persons. And he said, so we don't manage our relatives. We try to figure out how to cooperate and live with them. Think of how much our world would change if we took seriously every one of us did of honoring all of this life, these gifts around us. That's the other fascinating thing about indigenous worldviews. It's so valuable. Uh, the world is seen basically as, as full of gifts. None of us have to fill out a credit application to come into this world and take our first, first breath to see if we're credit worthy. We take that first breath as a gift. We're surrounded by beauty, by gifts, and we have artists who share this with us in their work and do so in the restoration of, of community. That, that in and of itself is an incredible expression of power, an expression, an expression of creativity. So if you take that shift from resources to relatives, there's something else that comes along with that. And I've heard this time and time again, so if you went to uh, my grounds, ceremonial grounds, uh, Polkat grounds for the Cherokee, uh, where uh, my Yuchi relatives and a lot of our five civilized tribes relatives who come to, you know, sometimes uh, observe our activities among the Zoyaha. If you go to our ceremonial grounds, our Zoyaha chief, traditional chief, very seldom talks about rights. They give us a lecture about responsibilities that we have. You know, when we live among resources, we spend all of our time arguing about and fighting about who has a right to that resource. And whose resource is that, really? When you live among relatives, you can shift that whole paradigm. We're not going to argue with you anymore about whose right it is to the land, the air, the water, the plants and animals. But we would like to have a discussion with you about our responsibilities to live well as relatives among the plants and the animals, with the land, the air and the water. There's nothing romantic about that. That's really kind of a, 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 a common way of saying, you know, the science of ecology, modern environmental science, and 
evolutionary theory kind of all roll up into ancient indigenous wisdom. We are all related. Sometimes we're embarrassed by that, or maybe we're, you know, not being always good relatives. But we are all related. The Lakota and, you know, up where Brett comes from, those Dakota speakers, when you hear them do prayers, Steve's heard this many times. When you get in those intertribal meetings, those leaders, those elders who offer prayers will use this phrase, Matakue Oyase. I asked one of my students one time, what is that phrase? I hear it every time an elder gives an invocation, Matakue Oyase. He says what we're saying is, we're praying for all of our relatives. And then he pulled out a button. This dates this story to the late 80s, by the way. Pulled out a button and it had that first picture of the earth from outer space on it. And written across it in Lakota was Metakue Oyase. We pray for all of our relatives. Because we have a responsibility to be good relatives. I mean, we have people who don't even want to give up their right to contaminate others with disease because you're infringing their inalienable right. We need, as Robin Wall Kimmerer just said this last week, we had a great discussion. I got to interview Robin, and she said, you know, my uh, Haudenosaunee relatives tell me the Founding Fathers got quite a bit wrong, really, about, you know, how to establish democracy. We won't go into all the details. But he said, one of our elders said the most important thing they did is they wrote a bill of rights when they should have written a bill of responsibilities. I don't, I, I think we could benefit by that tremendously today. Let's move from a worldview preoccupied with resources to life among relatives. Let's counterbalance those important inalienable rights. Indigenous people uh, uh, hold liberty and freedom as dear as any people on the planet, but they know those rights are hollow unless they're grounded with responsibilities. And if we do that, I think what we'll find is that we can start to really foster a kinship view of life on this planet again. And we can start thinking about what sovereignty, what responsibility, what freedom, what rights look like in a very complex set of relationships that really defy either or formulations of what we should do and how we should live. So to kind of conclude my remarks today, I'd, I'd like to just remind everyone of the following. We've probably, some of you probably heard the reports out of uh, COP26 and uh, it didn't end with a bang and it wasn't quite a whimper, but we know we've got a lot of work ahead of us, a lot of work ahead of us. And all I'd ask you to do to think about today is to remember the first peoples of this land and as we think about the Ka Nation and their effort to rematriate re that, that red stone, that sacred stone to their lands, as we think about all of the indigenous people who passed through this area and our tribes that were removed to Kansas but now make this their home. The Sackman Fox, the Iowa, the Potawatomi, the Kickapoo. As we think about those resident tribes, let's remember that we have people on the planet today who have knowledge we desperately need because their ideas, their philosophies didn't create the problems we see today. And I'll put forward to you, they just might hold some small pieces of insight and wisdom to help us address 
a terrible problem that is global now. And we can do that by trying to remember we live in a world full of gifts, express gratitude every day for this, for this, and the people who made it, and practice some generosity. Kind of the three G's. We live in a world full of gifts. We can express gratitude, and let's try to exercise generosity amongst ourselves. And with that, I think there's something to be hopeful about. I don't know how serious the problem of climate change will be. No one does, but I do know that if we took seriously the wisdom of the first peoples of this planet, I think there might be some opportunities to mitigate some of the most damaging aspects of what we're going to face. If we could just be good relatives and make sure our grandchildren remember us as good ancestors too. So I say Sanle, Sanle Gidasawa. Thank you everyone for coming and, and uh, for being kind and, and listening to me on a Sunday afternoon. I didn't do my 50 minutes, young man, so I'm sorry you're disappointed, but I'll catch up with you in about 15 or 16 years, okay? Okay, everyone. Bye-bye.